I uh, I very distinctly remember my sex scene where I'm <laughs> riding on the fuck machine and I'm I'm connecting with the doll that is beside me and I'm just like <gasps> because I do have what is known as a sensory processing disorder I call it a superpower because everything that I touch everything that I hear is heightened I yes. had a 15 pound weighted jacket that I was wearing as I was directing and that was my grounding tool Hey, I'm Casey Calvert. I'm Leanna Lovings. I'm Corey Chase. Hi, I'm Lauren Phillips. Hi, I'm Bree Mills, and you're listening to the Adult Time Podcast. Thank you so much for officially coming on the Adult Time Podcast. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. It makes sense because you are one of our ambassadors. Obviously, we work together a lot. Um, and I would love to use our space today to talk about some of the incredible projects that you've been working on. But let's start by getting to know, for those who don't know you already, like a little bit about your journey to become Leanna Lovings. And um, yeah, let's start there. So how did, how did Leanna Lovings become Leanna Lovings? For uh, those of you who are listening in uh, and it is your first time experiencing me, I just want to say it is a very absolute pleasure to meet you. And uh, I would absolutely love to regale everyone on uh, my discovery and identity and and sexual focus. Uh, Leanna Lovings became Leanna Lovings in uh, July 20th, 2017. That is Leanna Lovings' birth. That's her birthday. And uh, I realized at that time that I really wanted to embrace all of the things that I had repressed through the years. I was a very sexually repressed girl. I didn't know uh, how to touch myself. I had not orgasmed for the entirety of my life. Um, every time that I got close, I would get this moment of Christian guilt. And I had found myself... Um, <laughs> having secret like online uh, chat room experiences where I would go in and I'd be like, hey, guys, what if I like, what if I took my shirt off? Would that be cool? And like, what if I took a spoon from my mom's kitchen and spanked myself? And uh, those experiences really showed me something because the chats always would say like, hey, what, you know, you could get paid for this, right? Like, you don't just have to have fun doing all of this experimentation. Like you don't have to just do it alone. You can have even more people watching and joining you on this journey. And that's exactly what I think Leanna Lovings is. I think that she is a, a journey that's there for, for everyone who's had their, their own difficulties trying to embrace what they feel on the inside. I realize now that I have so many fetishes, so many things that my body is willing to embrace that I never would have thought possible when I was younger. And how did like um, once you start, started working within sex work and within the adult community, how did that that kind of book open for you where you discovered like what led you to be open to discovering all these different potential kinks and fetishes? Because it takes a lot of kind of guts to open yourself up like that. Yeah. Um, you know, I had a really great support group of friends that really opened me up into those things. And I started very, very slowly. I, I feel like the best way I can describe it was that I was so afraid of the world. I was so afraid of sexuality. The only way that I at first could achieve like fantasy of even having sex or intimacy with someone else was through reading fan fiction. And then I started listening to like sexy audio tapes because I couldn't even imagine myself looking at someone naked. And that's, it's so deeply ingrained The religion really changes and brainwashes you, I believe, into to, to having this set of rules that if you, if you don't do them, you are damned forever into eternity. And um, my friends kind of opens me up to the idea of like, what if you just... We're, we're honest to yourself. It's not a sin to masturbate. You know, the Bible doesn't say that. You can just do it. And I, I started with that and I started, you know, my online journey. And then eventually I felt like, okay, after I had my very first girl-girl experience on camera, uh, like uh, online, I decided maybe I want to experience more people. And the more girls that I worked with, I realized finally, 2021 in September, that was my very first boy-girl sex scene with Isaiah Maxwell. 
Amazing. Mm -hmm. Also an adult time ambassador. The absolute perfect first experience into porn, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I just, I felt so safe. I felt so welcomed. For me, porn was the perfect step up from camming because it was like, I can have sex and I'm not alone. There's like five people. There's tons of cameras. There's a sense of you have to go through this paperwork and you have to say that you're consenting and you're talking about your likes and your dislikes. And there's an entire system that is built to protect you. And I feel kind of sad that people kind of can't have that in normal sex, right? Because consent isn't just automatically built in to, to our societal structure nowadays. And it, it, it never has been really. I, I feel like porn is so much safer than than uh, other intimate experiences. And uh, that is why I got into the industry. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt uh, it's been almost three years now. It'll be three years this September. I'm very excited about that. But I feel like um, every moment that I share all of the love that I have to give and feel and share with someone um, – that I'm growing into more of who I want to be as Leanna Lovings. One thing about your story that I also find really interesting, and maybe it also speaks to just like um, how you tune into sensations, right? Because I know that that's, that's yes. something that's really important to you, was the fact that part of your your early experimentation was within the BDSM community, right? So yes. that was before you ever shot pro content or maybe even cam you started within BDSM. So maybe tell us a little bit about that as being, you know, your first experience. Cause again, okay. many people might be like, wow, that's, that's throwing yourself in the deep end. I actually have kept this story hidden from every single other interview that I have done. So this will be the first time that I actually really talk about it. Um, I was so scared of having sex. I was so scared of penetrative sex. And I also thought like, oh, well, you know, I'd be sinning if I really had sex. So what if I just, you know, what if I went into BDSM? I, I wanted to, to experience all of the intimacy that you could have, all of that closeness, all of that bonding and uh, without penetration. And I realized, oh, you know, BDSM does have consent. BDSM has all of these talks. And um, so I, I got into uh, like my local kink community and they were very supportive. I went to a munch, which is known as like a, it's like a kink social. It's a bunch of people from the kink community and they all get together and they just have lunch together in a restaurant. You know, it might be like 10 people. It might be 25. It's so wonderful because it's just an environment of almost having a second family mm -hmm. where you could go. And all of these people have done unimaginably wonderful kinky things. And uh, so I got into BDSM and I, my very first experience with BDSM was very first night I ended up in a full body diamond tie. Uh, and that is where you are entirely wrapped up uh, from the neck down to your toes. Um, and I was so like wound up. It felt so good. You know, they started with my wrist and they thought, oh, well, do you want a little bit more rope? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And the girl that was around me, um, I'll just call her Miss Tripp because that was her. That was one of her names, Miss mm -hmm. Tripp. Um, she would check up on me and she just she'd walk up and she's like, Oh, do you want a gummy bear? Do you want water? Are you hungry? How are you feeling? I feel like I should put a pillow under your head right now. Is that okay? And I just I felt so welcomed by that that I ended up uh, going to play parties. I ended up uh, doing bondage in public. I ended up uh, going to uh, dungeons. And that was sort of what I experienced uh, before I got into camming. It's, it, was, it was very interesting kind of describing that prelude because it sounds so separate. Like how can you go into something that usually people do when they're bored with sex? Right. With with like they're bored with missionary. They go to bondage. It's mm -hmm. just like usually people believe that there are so many steps that you have to go into before you do it. But for me, that was the first step because no penetration, no way. Well, it's 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 interesting, too, because even when I asked the question and you were explaining, I, I, I realized for myself, well, you know, w most people think of BDSM as this very heavy, hardcore, you know, again, focusing just on the visual. And the reality is there's so much to 
the communication and the aftercare. And in a way, it's probably the safest space to yes. start, right? And certainly more safe than a lot of maybe civilian experiences where there aren't those kinds of guardrails. So I think that's an amazing thing to share. Thank you for sharing with us. And I think it helps to open up people's eyes to like how it is actually as a first step, right? I could talk about yeah. this all day because it was for me in the kink community, like you would walk up and you'd just say to someone, is it okay if I hug you? You ask for consent to hug someone. Mm -hmm. And outside of the kink community, there are issues like specifically with family members where it's just like, oh, well, you're my niece. I should hug you. I should be able to hug you. And they might say, oh, I don't want to hug you. And sometimes they're they're forced to hug their aunt, they're forced to kiss their uncle. You know, it's it's all of this intimacy that has gone on without consent, and you're taught to ignore your feelings. Mm -hmm. It's it's installed at that at that early age. But also BDSM is so like uh, one of the play parties I went to. They had a naked cuddle puddle. Everyone was just cuddling and just not doing anything else. It's just cuddles or there was a massage train where it was 15 people lined up just massaging each other's backs in a dungeon that's great nick i love the names right the munch the cuddle <laughs> puddle yeah. massage yeah, train they have cuddle puddle parties like bdsm isn't all whips and chains it's gentleness i'm nervous what the fuck are you nervous about we haven't seen each other since we all went off to college to begin with. What if they don't even like me anymore? Spin around. Are you trying to impress someone? You look great. Uh, hi. This is my girlfriend. I hope you don't mind if she crashes your party. We're gonna relive high school. Let's relive high school. Oh my god. <laughs> I think we're one sleeping bag short. She'll be fine. Will she though? It's because you did everything you could to make her feel excluded. So did you. Okay, but the difference is I'm gonna make it up to her. So I'm leaving because you don't want Morgan thinking I'm your girlfriend? I just don't wanna confuse them. I don't want them thinking I'm your girlfriend either. <gasps> Look at you. You came back from college hot. So, Let's talk about, I mean, you know, within your career over the last almost three years, you've, you've, you know, done a lot of different kinds of content. Uh, I'd love to speak to you a little bit about your experience with VR, because I know you've also done a bit of directing in VR as well, right? So as someone who is in tune with her senses, how do you enjoy that as a medium? So I love creating in VR specifically uh, because I feel like it is the medium that connects to the fans the deepest, right? Um, there's no secondary male performer. It's all, well, I mean, there is. Obviously, you have to have a penis to be able to emulate the sensation of you having sex with the porn star. But as soon as you put that headset on, Really, that body is yours, and you're experiencing her looking at you. You're experiencing their kiss, their breath, their touch. Um, and uh, because I do have what is known as a sensory processing disorder, I call it a superpower because everything that I touch, everything that I hear is heightened. Um, uh, I am able to almost anticipate uh, like what they might be feeling in response towards all of the attention and all the all of the love that I'm giving them if I'm performing and if I'm directing that I'm looking at the performer and I'm saying I'm considering the pace that they're going at I'm considering like what does what does the audience want to hear and specifically what sensations should we emulate how do they want to be touched how would I want to be touched if I'm sitting there and um I I love directing the pace of VR because it is so uh, it, it's so formable to that very, very deep physical experience. That was um, a great segue into a plug that I want to make, which <laughs> is um, about your original series for Adult Time. So obviously as an ambassador, one of the th cool things that we get to do are to create content together. And you came to me with a really fascinating concept, and I would love – to hear from your words, your inspiration behind Intimately POV. Intimately POV is really born from the passion that I have to connect with the audience. Um, 
my personal philosophy is in everything that you do and everything that you are and in everything that you will be, be loving. And I want to find ways to express that love, right? But I also want to find, I see a need in people specifically in this uh, like chronically online world where people need to feel connection and they also deserve to know what healthy love and healthy experiences are. There's so much porn that is so fast paced. I think a lot of like the gooners out there probably get sometimes tired or desensitized to all of the super fast paced porn. And I, I wanted to show something that showed what it's like when a girl really does love you or wish fulfillment, fantasy fulfillment. What do you want to feel out of the girl that's always ignored you, but suddenly she recognizes you and sees you for who you are? That is uh, the story for uh, one of the intimately POV uh, scenes that are out right now, actually. And uh, we did a, a kind of a cool thing, obviously, like, you know, we like to shoot things, release them. We kind of look at how the audience watched them, what they liked, what they didn't like. And, and for the next round of episodes we're shooting, I love the fact that we took kind of very popular themes and are going to tell them in a way that's still faithful to the theme, but with this like change in tone. And sometimes that's often what's missing, right? Yeah. Uh, the change in tone. So how do you, how do you imagine we can Trojan horse that feeling of intimacy back into people who are so conditioned towards wanting, you know, the, the most popular tropes or that fast paced type of content that you mentioned? So the way that I see it is, I mean, love has so many different angles, right? Healthy love has so many different ways of showing itself. And so what we are doing, I love the way that you use Trojan horsing because that really is the perfect descriptor for this, using those very popular tags, the, the fast paced nature of, of like maybe uh, stepson, stepmom scenes or uh, lesbian squirting scenes, uh, using those images, but capturing still either the, the fiery intensity of, of genuine gentle passion or, you know, being able to say, uh, using the comforting, mothering, adulting tone of saying like, hey, it's okay to be comfortable with your kinks. You don't have to, to be afraid of sharing what you want. Communication is really what matters. As long as we're instilling those values, I think that we're still also helping and we're able to still also satisfy that kind of wish fulfillment of, hey, I wish someone did say those things to me. I wish someone was as nurturing like that to me sexually and emotionally. When you uh, when you first kind of step behind the camera and were working with us and, you know, taking that vision that you have that's so strong and imparting it upon your actors, what was that experience like? Um. I was so incredibly nervous the first time I was on set. There had been all of this excitement building up. And if you think of if you think of particles, if you think of atoms in the way that they build up energy, that's what I felt like. I felt like I was a, a slowly, tightly condensing ball of atoms that was about to explode in some kind of nuclear fusion. It was that that was genuinely um I felt so much planning going into it that the day that it happened, I was like, okay, I'm here. I did all the stuff. I thought about it. It's all here. I wrote it and then we, we're going to do it. I have the vision, but uh, like, how am I going to tell everyone what my vision is? I lost my words and I remember specifically you coming in and helping me with that because I had spent so much time talking with you about what my passion was. You knew exactly how to tell everyone. And you were such an inspiration to me my very first day directing because I had seen you uh, involved in other projects and present for the other projects. But like that atmosphere was so different that it felt like a much more uh, intensely educational moment for me where I was able to, to pick up like, okay, so this is how you talk to the crew in this way. And this is the atmosphere that you want to create where everyone is confident about what they're creating. I was able to, to let kind of let go of my nervousness and, and really embrace this unbridled sense of creativity that we were making something awesome. 
Well, you know, I'll I'll, I'll tell you that it, it, you may have been a, an exploding atom bomb inside, <laughs> but you were pretty pretty calm and collected on the surface. So well done. I just remembered. Uh, I think Seth Gamble because he was on set with Anna Claire Clouds. Um, we were all giggling because I I had a weighted jacket. I yes. had a 15 pound weighted jacket that I was wearing as I was directing. And that was my grounding tool to keep myself from uh, exploding. There you go. <laughs> well, which I which I very promptly afterwards bought a weighted like <laughs> like not a not the jacket, but like so the blanket. Good. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. Oh, my God. I'm so nervous. I've just never done anything like this before. I've been wanting it for so long and I know it's gonna be amazing in there. So just remember, whatever happens, I'm with you. I'm ready. <laughs> this is so cool. Oh my God. <laughs> As an adult time ambassador, obviously you get to work on a whole bunch of different projects. And one of the things I think is so cool about you is you shoot all kinds of different stuff. Maybe walk us through some of your like most memorable adult time moments in terms of the different projects you've done. Oh my gosh. I mean, recently I just uh, finished uh, co-starring in one of your amazing projects, Birth. It was absolutely fantastic being involved in that. And I have to say it was so creatively fascinating and out of this world, uh, just the essence of uh, the fact that my character was the mistress of, of, of Matthew and Lauren. Those are the two characters. Um, and how I, I was working as the doula to really uh, comfort the, the the pregnant wife that was really just going through all of this, and the following and and just being completely almost oblivious in some ways to the absolute dread and horror movie that this was for her. Um, I I absolutely love your your creative skill because of that. But like one day, you know, I might like watch someone wearing a pregnancy belly. Another day, I might be wearing the pregnancy belly, and that I is might true. have a, a two foot penis and giving birth to alien legs, like in uh, the Futa scene that I recently did that released with Serene Siren. That was a great way to describe it. Like even just if you <laughs> left it at that. <laughs> Yeah, there's been a few massage scenes tossed in and, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. but yeah, like yeah. really it comes down to like being involved in, in, in prosthetics of in some form yes. or fashion. Yes, prosthetics and uh, being involved in just different uh, creative scenarios. Like I never know if I'm going to be an evil scientist one day or the victim of an evil scientist. That is true. What was it like going through? Because as you mentioned for Fuda World, like that was a very, very prosthetics heavy project and you had to undergo like several transformations. What was that day on set like? It's so fascinating because I thought uh, it would be more challenging being a very sensory focused person. I thought that I might get overstimulated, but I wasn't. I, I felt so relaxed. I remember just like I'm slightly reaching over for a, a cup of coffee or something and they're they're painting the pregnancy belly they've got uh they're painting with like a, a type of uh glycerin and just other elements and just really adding the stains to the belly to match my skin tone and the weight suddenly it's like wow I started with the the penis and that was so much fun like accidentally bumping into things and wiggling it around um, it actually added um, a lot more sensory delight than anything else. What was it like working with the prosthetic penis? The prosthetic penis was fascinating because you just, it kind of gave me a perspective into what being a guy is like. I know that not every man has a two foot penis, <laughs> but I do understand that there is something that is present between your legs and suddenly you have to walk differently to adjust to it. Suddenly you have to, to be aware that when it is stiff, it is it is a separate appendage that you have to just be very considerate of. Um, 
that is absolutely what it was like. But I, I really appreciate the team that spent hours just setting up Serene and I on that day. It was so wonderful. Well, the final result was amazing. Yes. Yes, it was amazing. And it's not the first time you have been in a sort of lab setting for adult time because you were also in our transfixed film that Stella Smut did this past year, yes. the Dolls film. So what was that like? So you were really working with like a whole all-star cast of both like, you know, like all different kinds of women on that project. I loved being the evil scientist in that one, or just, you know, the quirky, excited scientist. I uh, I very distinctly remember my sex scene where I'm <laughs> riding on the fuck machine and I'm, I'm connecting with the doll that is beside me and I'm just like... <gasps> I understand what you're feeling right now. And we're like holding hands as we orgasm. It was just, there are so many different elements. When you see so many beautiful people in one room and all of their creativity corresponding to create a film, right? Whether you're cast or whether you're a performer, everyone is contributing and there is no part that is obsolete because it is all functioning to create that one output. That is the project as well that ever since then, whenever <laughs> I see one of our, you know, writers or or creatives that put in a short sequence with a fuck machine, <laughs> I say there is no such thing as a short sequence with a fuck machine because just even getting in, setting it up, is setting up, so getting long. into place. Yeah. And if you're doing it alone as well, because I have a fuck machine yeah. at home now after the, the doll scene, I had to buy one for myself. It's as you know, it's, it's they're pretty what happens. Yeah. It's, it's the hazards of the job. It you, know, is. you just have to get one. And it's it's so difficult getting the angle correct. On set, we had someone that was able to say, okay, can you lift your hips? Okay, I have the angle prepared for you. I'm going to turn the remote on. <laughs> but you have to do all of that yourself uh, when you're when you yeah. don't have such an amazing crew that's there with you. And I remember because I I came I I was on set that day, I think, because I was doing the yes. non-sex role and I kind of walked in halfway through and and went like Oh boy. <laughs> like this is an ask. This is an ask of every everyone was sort of like, we're doing it. You were you guys were all such troopers. Yeah. But I remember too, like the other realization was when because there's always that remote, right, that controls the speed. You can't just hand that remote to somebody and be like, go ahead and control. Like that's quite <laughs> it's one is quite a huge amount of trust. It's a huge amount of trust and responsibility and intimacy. And like you're going to control the thrusting speed of this machine. <laughs> and you know, yeah, just do it casually. Yeah. So like the whole thing was a learning experience. Yeah. <laughs> I now I now say if a fuck machine is going in a scene, that is at least half a day gonna be dedicated to like the care of that process. So yeah. um <laughs> and we had two fuck machines and two performers. At the same time, hold, like you said, holding hands. It was, yeah. again, and a very small part of the script. Yeah. Anyway, we all learn things. Um, <laughs> what, uh, uh, <laughs> um, what about being an adult time ambassador resonates the most strongly with you? That is such a difficult question because there are so many things that align with this ambassadorship for me emotionally I have a lot of support for the amount of consent that adult time reinforces. Uh, the the level of care and detail that everyone goes into to make sure this is what we're doing on set today. How do you feel about the element of this script? How do you feel about this? The amount of, of focus that goes into making sure that everyone feels comfortable is so important to me. I'm so proud to be able to represent a company that actually really does put performers first. I, I feel that in my heart. Um, and I feel like the more that performers enjoy what they do, the better the quality of the content is going to be. And I also believe that for uh, having creative license and also just working on so many fun projects, I never feel like I'm working on the same thing every day. I feel mentally stimulated. I feel challenged in my skills. And I love having uh, a chance as an ambassador to be able to focus on those things, to, to focus on my skills as an actor or a director or what whatever I want to do. I feel like I have the resources to do it. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate having that opportunity and also being able to just cooperate with such amazing people 
being an ambassador alongside like people with such history and such skill with everything that they've done, I feel like you have made like the Avengers of porn. <laughs> like, well, I did, you guys are the, I mean, you definitely are the Avengers of porn. <laughs> I don't think I made any of you. I think you all made yourself, which is why you're the Avengers of porn. I meant that you like collect. I, I collect. All of I did us. collect. Yes. I did collect the yeah. Avengers. Of porn. <laughs> the creation of the of the Avengers. I asked you all to, <laughs> to to hang out. So, who or what are you running away from? It was a bad situation. We don't want to talk about it. I don't like this situation, and I don't like her. This was supposed to be our special night. I'm out of here. You can deal with them yourself. Wait, where are you going? You brought them here. I'm, don't leave me here with those freaks. I'm pretty sure he's gone. Yeah, but for how long? Long enough. I don't like it. Something's not right here. Do you remember what almost happened last time? I don't want to stay here any longer than you have to. Well, then let's find out where they keep their money and get out of here. You mentioned this earlier, and I the point stuck with me, and, and just again now. So you know we do, we do so much work around consent and communication about sex in our in our day to day job. How can we better influence you know people who don't work in the line of work we do? Like how can we how can we be a good example for consent and communication out there? Because it is something that is really really important. I think that the best thing to do is to normalize mental health. Um, porn stars, we all have such a captive audience, right? Like they're there to jerk off, but when they look on someone's social media and they look at what they're posting or what they're feeling, that really does have an influence on them. Whether, whether we believe it or not, we truly are influencers and there's a reason why we're called that. And I feel like that also means that we are called to have at least a healthier representation of uh, processing our emotions, of being able to deal with those things, and also just being open about them, uh, creating that discussion, creating the room for that discussion so that people uh, say to themselves, you know what, I never thought about that before. I like making videos on, on TikTok where I say, hey, this is my reminder for you to take care of yourself today. And that's like, you know, someone gets to see that and say, oh, you know, I, I guess, you know, someone cares about me, someone's thinking about me, and I should take care of myself. Mm -hmm. um, but also it's like the more that we're focused on, on mental health topics, I feel like just the more change we can make. And it's possible for anyone. You also have a, I, I've been working on a couple of really cool initiatives that I, I would love you to share out. The first would be some of that kind of guidance around new talent. I know that you've been working uh, on some kind of good best practices for newer talent. And the second about the uh, um, anonymous uh, event that you're organizing. Yes. So uh, the first thing is that I'm helping uh, my agency create a booklet that can be accessed by any agency and any performer where it's basically uh, resources that you can use uh, as a new performer. Because I feel like so many of us came in without those things. And if you weren't in a model house, if you weren't with a group of models starting out, then you didn't have those things of, oh, we're all going through this together. Right? If you're staying on your own, if you're staying in an Airbnb or a hotel for first couple times alone, that might be really daunting not knowing like, oh, these are the supplements that I should take because I'm an athlete now. Mm -hmm. They don't consider like, oh, I actually need to take care more of my body than I did before. And that includes vitamins that you aren't accustomed to taking because you're using very specific resources from your body to be able to reproduce those needs, to be able to stay wet. That's such a weird thing that you have to think about because, uh, you know, vaginal moisture is also an indicator of physical health. So like suddenly you won't be as wet anymore if you're not taking care of your body or just like, uh, should I take D-mannose to protect myself from STIs? You know, um, I particularly use that for like it, it flushes the urinary tract. Mm -hmm. That's super helpful. Um, and my other project is uh, 
I have officially created a class, uh, or rather a workshop where everyone can sit in. It's entirely anonymous, entirely free. Uh, it's going to be centered towards performers providing resources uh, known as like uh, an emotional or coping toolbox that allows people to process their emotions and their feelings after after difficult events and being able to, to show themselves self-compassion. Uh, I feel like uh, after so many performers that I've spoken to, the thing that we are very strongly lacking in is uh, gentleness to ourselves. There's so much criticism. There's so much influence of body dysmorphia. So um, I have invited uh, Miss Corrales Solomon, of, uh, a professor of psychology at the University of Florida, who is also a licensed therapist, uh, who will be providing those resources for anyone who wants to come in uh, July 20th at 6 p.m. PT. I will be posting uh, the link on my social medias and anywhere else I can get it out to people. Amazing. Well, when when I think about what the best part about having ambassadors is, it's it's initiatives like that. So it's being able to get behind, um, you know, a, as a company to be able to get behind really important initiatives and ideas. So thank you for that. It's amazing. Um, the... Last question before we go into the <laughs> very exciting rapid fire segment of today uh, is, um, you know, we've talked a lot about what you've done with Adult Time, about your journey, about, you know, your your uh, own experience. Give us a, a little a little look inside uh, when when Leanna Lovings is is uh, not on set. What are your favorite things in life to do? Oh, my gosh, I have so many things. <laughs> Um, it's difficult because sometimes I, I'm so focused on work that all I do, and this is very unhealthy, I don't recommend this to anyone, but all I do is I work, I eat, I shower, and then I sleep, <laughs> and then I work, eat, shower, sleep, and then I forget to, to have that kind of uh, mentally stimulating release of any kind, uh, but other times I'll, I'll read a book. I have bookazines now, which is magazines that are as thick as books that talk mm -hmm. about world topics. That's like my most stimulating thing. I'm like, oh, okay, this is what's going on in the world. I enjoy this. Or um, I'll play video games. I have a Steam Deck, which is a like a portable console that I just take with me that has all my PC games. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll read, I'll draw, I'll sing, I'll just do whatever comes to mind. Still always some sort of artistic expression, right? Yeah. Yes. In, in everything, it has to be artistic expression. I don't like being confined to one way of expressing any kind of idea. Yeah. I just want to have as many tools as possible to create everything that I think or see or feel, just whatever it is. Well, the first time we ever met, that was the first conversation we had. <laughs> was about was about your, your digital drawings. And, and it left quite an impression on uh, that you're, you're a cool cat. With some cool cats, <laughs> and uh, you've got a lot of amazing things to share. Um, now, probably the most poignant, the most poignant part of our conversation. <laughs> All right, Leanna Lovings, do you watch your own scenes? No. <laughs> I will watch some scenes, but I'm so self-conscious I can't. I'll watch the trailers and then I'll judge myself so much. I just say, no, I can't. I can't look at it. I'm not good enough. <laughs> just wait till you get more directing experience under your belt. You will only watch the intros and the ends. <laughs> But but and, and you'll you'll judge like you know everything about oh god you know I could have done that cut or I done that. <laughs> so what's your favorite role play scenario right now? I I don't have any. <laughs> I have uh, I have like I. I, 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 it's funny because my mo my motto is me, my hands, and my imagination. That's how I masturbate usually. I know I said I have a fuck machine, but like that that's the way that I masturbate. It's just that. And sometimes my imagination, like the person doesn't even have a face. They're just, they're petting my hair. And they're like, maybe they'll braid my hair or something as they have sex with me. That's gentleness and like kissing all over my skin and just like saying like, oh, I'm there with just something super, super generic, which is funny because I have wild dreams about all sorts of things, priests and glory holes and whatnot. And, you know, um, I, I, I do that. I would like to say, I'm going to call that like a Rapunzel role play. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a faceless Rapunzel role play. Yeah, that's what it is. So pick one. I know neither. So pick one. 
Call of Duty or League of Legends? League of Legends. Okay. In 30 seconds, explain to me why so that I am better educated on the options. I love League of Legends because I have so many fantastical characters and fun girly skins, but also like um, there's just lots of sexy characters and you have like different lanes. It's a different type of lane management system and there's a lot of cooperation and it's more predictable in terms of waves and phases of minions that you get to shoot. Uh, Call of Duty is very highly competitive and there's like a lot of middle schoolers calling you all sorts of slurs uh lots of angry teenage boys as well that like this is like this man eats cereal with his hands i've heard that before um like it just is silly stuff and if they find out that you're a girl on either one they'll they'll freak out but um call of duty is like great as like a third person shooter but it's you know, I, I just, I love League of Legends. I'm going to stick to Super Mario Brothers, the <laughs> original <laughs> Nintendo version. Would you, would you rather, would you rather never have sex again or never eat your favorite food again? This is so easy for me. I would never eat my favorite food again. And I can say that confidently because I have a different favorite food every day. <laughs> I if if this came into effect, I'm assuming by contractual laws, it would be my favorite food at the time of signing said contract. Yeah. So therefore, my favorite food would just change to something else the very next day anyway. So what's your favorite food today? Oh, OK. Um, my favorite food today is uh, croquettes, ham croquettes. Oh, <laughs> see, you know. That is why we love you, Lena, because you never know what's going to happen. My favorite TikTok of you ever, which was a viral TikTok that we did, was you getting mic'd up and just just blissfully in your own world. And, and our social producer, Allison, asked you, what are you thinking about? And you just looked at her calmly and said, cinnamon rolls, <laughs> which uh, are very good. So I, I would, I would uh, definitely uh, pick some cinnamon rolls. Um, last one. If someone were going to slide into your DMs, and I'm already saying don't slide into anybody's <laughs> DMs, but if you were, if someone was going to slide in, what would be the best way for them to slide into your DMs? Um, cat pictures. That's true. I, I can uh, I can vouch for that. Because if someone sent me a cat picture, I would immediately go, oh my gosh, 10 out of 10, would cuddle the best cat that I've ever seen in my entire life. Leanna. Lovings. The name says it all. Okay. She's an adult time ambassador. She's an incredible performer and she's an even more amazing human being. I am so stoked we got to have this convo with you all today. And if there's two things I want you to take away from this, all right? The first is intimately POV. The idea behind Leanna's series that's all about connecting people through their corn. And the second thing, eh, arguably maybe just as interesting, if you want to get on Leanna's good side, it just takes a cute cat pic. If you enjoyed chatting with Leanna, you can show your support by following all her links, checking out her adult time scenes. You can leave a comment. You can like this podcast. We always appreciate your support. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>